You are listening to DC On Screen. I'm David C. Robertson. Jason Goss sitting across from me. Got it. Uh, yeah, we have seen Joker Folly I Do. Indeed. Uh, I, if I knew it, and I'm sure I did. Oh, we're going full spoiler. We don't care, right? We are going full spoiler. Yeah. If you haven't seen Joker Folly I Do, you need to uh, not listen to our show for a minute. Go watch the movie. And I do say go watch this movie because it can be spoiled and we will spoil it. There's, I did not know we were going to certain places in this movie. Oh, spoilers will be out and they'll be out with vitriol too. Cause man, people picked sides before it even came out on this one. People picked sides. Look, I'll be honest. <clears throat> I went to this movie not giving a shit. Yeah. Those credits rolled and I turned to you and said, that was fucking that was dope. Really great. <laughs> <laughs> Like, and it's funny because, like, the there was, like, maybe four people in the theater when we first got there. And about 30, 35 minutes into it, he stood up in a huff and left. And Jason thought maybe he was going to get a for a pee break or something. I didn't catch the huff I part. did not. I did not. He, like, there was, like, a grunt huff. And I thought, hmm, you know. I just thought he, too, was 40 and yeah, standing up. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. that maybe at first. But when he walked out. Like the way he hit the door, like I heard the door hit. I was like, oh, no, he just did not like that movie. Sure enough, he never came back. He did not. I realized about 20 minutes later that I hadn't seen his profile. Over. I even looked down the theater to see if he just decided he'd gotten he'd get a closer seat on the way back. But, yeah. You know. So if um, by the way, if <laughs> we talked about it on the show, this is why I continually change my stances on this show, because like I sat there, I read. Todd Phillips saying in these interviews, this I wouldn't really call it a musical. I wouldn't call it a musical. I wouldn't call it a musical. There's music. Yes, they sing. I wouldn't call it a musical. And I was like, that's bullshit. He's just trying to get away with like doing a musical without being calling it a musical. I walked out of the theater going, that wasn't a musical. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't. Like there was, there were, there was singing. He had a few fantasy sequences. I still think he roughly did what. Because, all right. So you were like afraid he was going to do that. And I was more looking forward to the fact that he was going to do that. Well, it, he, but I think he effectively did that, but in a way that was pleasing. I like musicals. I don't, I'm not scared of a musical. My I'm favorite not. movie is a musical. But <clears throat> Which one was that? The, oh, Blues, the Blues Brothers. Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's funny because High Fidelity is my other like big top favorite. And they're not a musical, but, but there's a lot of music. Oriented. Yeah. Like, dude works in a record store. Yeah. Like, there's music all throughout the damn thing. <laughs> there's but, a theme. So I'm watching this thing and going like, yeah, it is not a musical. There is music here. And what I was mainly afraid of was, you know, Todd trying to backtrack and just looking stupid and being like, don't try to sell us some bullshit when you're clearly just doing a thing. Yeah. But you thought he was copping out beforehand. Or just, I did. Just making some safe space for himself. I did. But, you know, and I mean, people have different opinions on this. Clearly, if you go online and you start looking around, people are like, that was crap. That was a musical. There was no Batman. There was no I didn't see, I was like, no, Todd absolutely told me the truth. Like there wasn't a ton of music. There were some songs, um, and, but I loved it. Like I loved how like in the real world, when they were singing, their voices were bad mm -hmm. and how when in the fantasy world, their voices were pretty good. Yeah. Like they, there was a progression and as they went further, like even in the fantasy, the voices got better and better. Mm -hmm. I thought that was neat. Like as their confidence they kind of grow grew. into it, yeah, yes, yeah. Well, the performances even about midway through, uh, once they do the Sunny and Chair kind of bit, mm -hmm. like once they get to about that area and he starts really filling out his little middle space of these mm -hmm. musicals, he really goes, you know, full ham and bat, and like in the back end of it, like they are they are full on motherfucking pieces at the end of it, like the mountain, mm -hmm. the kind of gospely mountain bit, yeah. Um, which incidentally, a, a overall note about these, I don't know who wrote them, I would suspect Lady Gaga was involved, but like. Good music for the thing. Yeah. Good music in general. I good mean, score. I know uh, certain it, ones were obviously songs that I knew. Some some yeah. weren't. I mean, you know, you're going to have Win the Saints as a as yeah. a theme, frankly, yeah. throughout the um, – uh, honestly, the song When the Saints Go Marching In is basically a character in this movie. Mm -hmm. And I, I dug all that. Yes. Um, I mean, you're basically looking at the beginning of a religion yeah, a little bit. Like, and that, that was one of the uh, best things. I really loved this movie. Um, I think I think it was neat, you know, and it was a scathing indictment of the people who went and saw the first one and 
walked out thinking that he was the hero. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yes, yes. He was very shit on him in society. And yeah, fucking, yeah, he, uh, Robert De Niro got what he fucking deserved. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, so does Arthur Fleck at the end of this movie mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because he did take it too far. Mm-hmm. And just because you're mentally ill doesn't mean you should do take certain things. Or, you shouldn't go killing a bunch of fuckers. Mm-hmm. You, know, you just can't. So it's gonna catch up to you. It, it does catch up with you. And it does in such a wonderful I mean, the, way. The whole movie was going to culminate in it catching up to him. He was given the death sentence. In fact, they didn't show it, but that was what was on yeah. the table. So he was going to be killed, uh, fried, according to that one guard. But, I mean, he was he was dying either which damn way. Yeah. But, yeah, sure enough, um, that's the the big ending there is like, yeah, the, this, this Joker dies. Yeah. Arthur Fleck dies. Yeah. And they make a point of... Like, there's. Uh, I love that. Like, his attorney is trying to get him off, being like, eh, "It's a separate entity. It's this a multiple personality kind of situation." And Even their treatment of him is a bit of an indictment on people who are like trying to make. He is, for the most part, I actually agree with their defense in the sense that he is deeply troubled and needs help mm-hmm. rather than punishment. Yeah. Um. But you can tell that they're trying to make the case. He's got to participate in his case and, and a little bit like all the leading questions. Right. And then those, those are the, I believe that's baked into the film on very much on purpose mm-hmm. because he, re, he regurgitates the wording word for word in the interview later yeah. with the man who's much funnier than you would know if you just saw this movie mm-hmm. <laughs> like, um, and has a way better American accent than I thought. Yeah. But um, yeah, he like, he uses the entire wording about like seeing lights and everything kind of went black for a second. Like, yeah. He's very specifically is getting led by his, legal team into this Mm -hmm. and you know speaking of legal team uh there's a lot of thoughts with pretty much anything in this movie that i'd unpack but do you get the sense over the course of like there's just scenes where he uh so this movie has a a lot of leaving the camera on people and letting them react yes uh like the film could easily have been an hour and a half in Mm -hmm. terms of what happened there's two hours 18 because you you get you're breathing with what happened and, and it kills me because we were walking in and I was like, how is this thing not 80 fucking minutes? Like, <laughs> I can't. Uh, how are we going to do two and uh, two and 18? I mean, in terms of story, I could have if you wanted to. It, but. Dude, if it, if I didn't have to pee so bad, I would have been fine for two eighteen. Chill, like, yeah. it was gorgeous and it was macabre and it was pretty. sad. But one of the reactions I keep getting is that he he almost keeps looking at the his legal team in a way that's like. You get the sense that he he'll spare them, mm-hmm. like whatever is about to happen. Like they seem to be actually treating him like a human. He seems to recognize <laughs> that they actually are trying to treat him like a real person that mm-hmm. needs help. And like that, kind of like um with his friend there at Puddles. Yes, where he they were nice to each other. He didn't hurt him, just like he said. Mm-hmm. That was the deal. He would have left the lawyer alone too if that was in the same situation. And then he gets choked up afterwards because he he did not hurt him after all. Like yeah. He, he faces his own consequences. Like that's part of the movie's charm to me. Yeah. There is a very consequence heavy movie. He does. And I love that. Like he winds up as Arthur falling in love with Lee. And then we get to the end and realize, no, she's not in love with Arthur. She's in love with Joker. Oh, yeah. She's in love with something that she created. Yeah. And like, so all these people who are his followers, they're not, his, they're not Arthur's followers. They don't care about him. No. They are in love with this idea. Mm-hmm. The fantasy they keep saying. Right. It also kind of just sounds like Todd's taking the piss out of the fandom, doesn't it? A little bit. I mean, uh, like, oh, you you were mad because he wasn't the Joker? Well, guess what? He's not the Joker. Yeah, he's definitely not. I mean, <laughs> that appears to be possibly a trend that some of the auteurs are going to fight back on some of the fandom. And honestly, at this point, it's due. So Yeah, fine. Um, good with that. But yeah, it's, it's very much. I mean, think about it at the end. So he... Everything you could possibly want in the moment of him being convicted, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the guilty plea is coming down. He gets freed. Um, yeah, by bomb, by bomb. By the way, the one thing that I think the movie gets comics accurate about the Joker uh-huh. is that, to my estimation, the Joker's only real superpower is taking a fucking beating. Yeah, and Arthur Fleck Jesus. can take a fucking beating. Jesus, can he? Um, by the way, dude, during the so the they're in the courtroom getting the getting the guilty verdict. Mm-hmm. The bomb goes off. Mm-hmm. Arthur stands up and looking around. Mm-hmm. We see all these people laying about. Did you notice Harvey Dent? Oh, for sure. It's subtle. It's there, though. But it's there. <laughs> like, the appropriate side was facing where the bomb blast was. Yep. Uh, the, we got a bit of Two-Face there. 
He's yeah. awake, but stunned. He's awake, stunned, groggy. But one half of that face is not as pretty. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit mulched up. It was. A, little, a bit burnt. A bit singed. Yeah. Nice stuff. And I think that's as close as you're going to get to a nod to anything on this damn movie. Oh, definitely not, though. Because. Like, or a nod to any kind of built extra, you know, expansion of the universe. Um, Yes and no. Like, I thought it was fun in the way that, like, I thought it was clever the way that Todd, you know, in the first movie, uh, you had the guy in the Joker mask mm-hmm. who was inspired and followed Wayne, the Waynes down the alley. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're just perfectly happy to give some rich twats what they deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, here, and I was kind of like, I kind of had a feeling because we kept seeing this one guy, this one inmate, mm-hmm. like watching everything Arthur was doing. And With being, varying levels of excitement or disappointment. Yes. Being very, very <clears throat> like. Hard uh, on a sleeve a little bit here. Yeah. Like uh, very engaged. Yeah. And I thought he had a bit of a grin to him. And I went, oh. So, like, at the end of the movie, that guard's like, you got a visitor. And Arthur goes walking down that hallway. And that guy shows up. And he's like, hey, Arthur, I just want to tell you a quick joke. Or I just want to tell you a joke. Like, Can you make it quick? Yeah, yeah, I'll make it quick. Yeah. Fucker stabs Arthur several times. Goes off o- over a few feet away. And, like, cackling wildly, slits his own mouth he open. himself. He yeah. ledgers himself. As Arthur dies, I was just like, yeah, Todd Phillips actually said, no, this is a Batman universe. A you kind just, of one. You yeah. just didn't see the Joker. like, But yeah. Bruce Wayne is a kid and he's growing up right now. He's becoming and Batman. he's orphaned. <laughs> he's orphaned. This is happening. And we got a guy here in Arkham who was inspired but ultimately disappointed by this guy. Because even the joke he told about like the washed up fucking clown yeah. who let everyone down, he's going to get what he fucking deserves. Same, the same punchline yeah. that Arthur gave Murray yeah. before blowing his brains out. Ah, I just loved it. It was a good, it was I a really good book. I loved it. I mean, I did, the moment I saw that guy in the hallway, I, you know, you immediately put together what scene you're about to watch here. I just wanted to be like, Arthur, run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a, definitely a part of you that sits there and goes like, you feel for Arthur because you're like, ah, oh, dude. You- well, on the one hand, he's done everything he's done and he- he certainly needs to be dealt with in some capacity. Um, yeah. Helped and isolated, at least. But That's like, the thing. is like I felt for Arthur the same way uh, Poddles did about the guy that Arthur killed. He didn't yeah, deserve to didn't die. Deserve to die. Like, yeah. like his uh, Arthur's defense he, made such a good case. With, to be fair, yeah. Like Puddles didn't deny the bullying. He just said right. he didn't deserve that. Right. Um, um, but his the, his defense like worked on me. Like when she was talking about, you know, the, the sexual abuse and, and yeah. the beatings and all of this stuff from his childhood. Oh, I was like, she's a fucking rock star in the courtroom. By absolutely. The way. Absolutely. He may have he may have walked if she if he, hadn't he actually might have walked. He actually might have also walked if he didn't just like confess that there's no Joker. There's clearly a Joker. It's just that he realized that I think he realized that nobody cared about him. I mean, yeah, but in the course of like learning about the idea of the Joker, there's a few things stood out. One, yeah, he, I think he realizes he's not whatever that is at some yeah. point, and everyone's just pointed. She walks away. The crowd I think was away. Big part of that was puddles. Yeah, uh, puddles broke him a little bit. Broke, yeah, he yeah, broke him down. Well, puddles broke him a little bit, but I think the the big event was that his insanity got his little sycophant in jail killed. And he mm-hmm. heard it. He heard it happen. Mm-hmm. And I think him being broken in that moment was what the, what the story was being told was that that like he was so broken in that moment that he saw his consequences. Yeah. And like I don't know, there was I think remorse for that for that moment. But people that are following meant, him for something he's not. Yeah. And for that moment, that meant that I mean he's just not going to be the Joker. And I for, mean he tried. Yeah. And for everything that he, for every way that everyone made him feel, he has now become that. And he says people. later, as he's pulling yeah. the stool up, I was going to give an angry rant. And you like to this. There's still some steam in the Joker engine when he's going to the courtroom that day. Mm-hmm. But it, it it just it just leaves, and it just leaves at some point. They leave him. the The entire fantasy dies, as as she puts it. Like, and yeah, his his little his little buddy didn't make it. Like it, he abandons that. But the other things that stood out to me is, uh, in particular, uh, you know, the scene with the, the little mini riot when he gets back from the mm-hmm. when he's declared himself as lawyer and all. Yeah. That. It's just Arthur in his always diminished form. They never make him seem in any way imposing. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, even in Joker form, he's he's slick. Yeah. But he's not. And when he's got a gun, he's he's unpredictable. And that makes him dangerous. But he's not imposing. Yeah. Like, he was not going to win a fist fight with that dude in the hallway. It, much right. less a knife fight with right. him unarmed. But when he's when he has the makeup, the Joker makeup on, even when he doesn't sometimes. But, like, when the, you do see a shift. Like, he does Christopher Reeve that shit. He does. He very much like, does. He stops slumping and starts standing up right. Like, that, when he became the lawyer... And he's walking around the, and he had the southern accent. I like, love the fucking accent. The, yeah, the, the, the accent, accent work was, was a like great the whole like all the way around. Uh, Kill a Mockingbird, yeah. fucking Andy Griffith. Does that? Matt you can tell, he slips back into his real voice yeah. occasionally. Then he goes to puddles, yeah. like he's mocking the slightly Cockney accent like thing. He, yeah, it, that accent works beautiful. But he's always he. I mean, specifically the way he kicks the door open is the thing that all of us would imitate on a Halloween night dressed as the Joker. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but. There's something about his diminished form. No matter where you see him, all this stuff happens around him. He seems to be this, this the pin in the grenade. Like he does the, the the thing that's so crazy, no one would actually do it. He does it, but it's always yeah. something little. And, and it's not, he doesn't cause a riot. He doesn't cause the city to overturn. The city does that to himself. In mm-hmm. a way, they are the ledger that Joker that they were trying to prove in that movie. Yeah. But he only shot a couple of guys that were bullying him on a, on a train. Everyone else interprets the Joker out of this and mm-hmm. he believes it to some extent. Yeah. But yeah, it fails him eventually. And, but I just love the shot in particular of him up on, up on the table, everyone riding around him. That shot was a lot. I don't know. That one really stood out to me as how small he really is. Yeah. I, so I think even with that, with new, you know, healthier, uh, fresh faced Joker that right. came at the end, that may be the kind of person who was a little bit more formidable if say a, a Batman wandered around and wanted to beat some people up. Yeah. Like maybe someone could actually put up a fight. In that sense, but that proto Joker is always going to be a different thing. Like he's mm-hmm. he's taken the mantle from him and said, "If you're tired of the fantasy, I guess I'll run it as far as it'll go." Yeah, but he was done. Yeah, like it makes you wonder though, like because like Lee didn't actually kill herself. You know, she's still I believe around. she did. You think she did? I believe she did. I think that's well, we saw the gun at her head, but then later we saw her smoking at the stairs. We did, but I believe the uh, you shortened your hair. I believe is a I don't know. I think that's a nod. I think. Uh, there's a little bit of in his head, kind of like the same way we did at the end of the first one, where mm-hmm. we were wondering what's in his head, what's not. In my version of events, the way I interpreted that, I think he went up the stairs. And no one was there. And no one was there. And he knew in his heart what the rest of that conversation was. And, of course, they went to look for him there. Of course they did. The, mm-hmm. the cops finding him there would not be a, a story flaw for me. Yeah. He, I think he either maybe went up and saw her, found her maybe, or at least went up and thought he maybe knew what happened. I don't know. But- yeah, the idea about her hair being shortened in particular, I thought that was a a nod to something that happened to her head. Yeah, is how I did I, wonder how about I took that. It. That's an issue. Uh, yeah, okay, I like that take. And but to me, that means that if that is something that happened to her head, then he would know something specific. So it almost means that to me, he actually maybe did go find her in the apartment. Yeah, um, maybe I'm not sure though. That that would all be a wild interpretation. I also like the uh, well, I, you know, because I'm me and because I'm a comic fa- comic book fan. The fact that they kind of set up the Joker, the actual Joker, uh, cackling and laughing, and everything cackling, happened. laughing the whole nine. The fact that they set that up makes me kind of like, and because she rejected Arthur for not being real, the real Joker. There's a and there's an idea that I like of her kind of being out there somewhere and finds him glomming on to this new guy. I mean, that would be a way to go with it. Is she she finds him, you know, realizes no, that was the real guy the whole time. This other guy just held it. For a minute, mm-hmm. um, and then and if that's the case, yeah, she would take her little nod to Harley outfit and go full fucking Harley right. Quinn with it. Which, by the way, um, there is actually a, a really good amount of costume design snuck into these movies. Yeah, the, the Joker franchise so far. Oh yeah, the outfit alone was iconic. How many shelves did you see that on? Yeah, but goddamn, I love fucking Gaga's Harley Quinn outfit at the end. Yeah, I know that was in the trailers. Yeah, it, well. I knew it was there already, but I really dug um, it on screen. She so, stands out in the crowd really well. You know, I don't think we'll get another one of these movies. Mm. Like, I think this is done. I want it to be. It was um, it was good where it stands. I, you know, if they really wanted to, I think they could. You know, if they wanted to, I think they could uh, pick up a few years later. You know, with and say like this is all kind of rough backstory if they wanted, but mm-hmm. I don't think they will. I think it's done. 
if I was going to play a joke on everybody, it'd be to do this one and then maybe pick up one or two other Batman villains. Mm. Still never have the Batman involved and then make a fifth film where you have him. But the twist ending it there is he actually just goes fucking insane like he might have instead of becoming Batman. Right. And the whole franchise ends on a on a whimper. He's just like, he's just in Arkham. He's just actually a fucking lunatic who lost his parents. Yeah. He's just in Arkham in the yeah. mid 90s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, you know, I, I really, I, I think it's, it's so funny that people are having such a big problem with this movie. I, I'm, I'm guessing because it's a musical, but also because oh, Batman's, Batman's not in it. And I'm like, y'all, okay. But like, you know, this is like, if this is setting up a universe, if you really want it, if you want it, like it. it's a neat little nod. Um, it is a very weird cornerstone on which to build the foundation of a Batman type universe. Yeah. To go specifically so Joker and so surreal mm-hmm. at the same time. And well, surreal and real at the same time. So like, yeah, we've got all the groundedness of watching him take a beating and watching it have a toll on his body. I mean, you saw his shoulder mm-hmm. early on. Like there's the grounded gritty Nolan esque version of this, but then there's also it's a pretty wild interpretation of him in a lot of ways. But yeah. I don't know. It's, that's not going to turn into just like a, a Batman esque franchise that's going to be spun out of that. No. It, and I don't know how you would. I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't try to predict what I wouldn't want, want in this yeah. whole realm. I, you know, I, I could sit all day and go, oh, I don't want this. I don't want this. I do want this. I do want this. But I don't know. Like, I never know. Like, I didn't think I wanted this movie. And then it blew you away. It blew me away. And I was like, no, that was the perfect sequel. Like, it answered the questions that I wanted. Answered from the first movie. That was a good point. Yeah. I did want to know what, what happened to Sophia and her daughter. I did want to know, you know, what what Arthur's treatment looks like. I do want to know, like, what his trial looks like. I do, And I'll be damned. We got it. I wanted to know what the real body count was by the end of Joker 1. Yeah. Because it was. Yeah. <laughs> For him. <laughs> yeah. But it very much could have been a few other people we didn't Could've. know. I mean, like, I was happy to see that her and her daughter were even alive. Mm-hmm. Because one interpretation of the movie was they're not. Right. So, yeah, it was good to see at the end. I mean, I remember last our last review, we had a lot of questions about what did and didn't actually happen. Mm-hmm. This one actually gave us the answers. I was very happy about that. It gave us the answers, but also, like, I feel like Todd turned around and said, look, I'm, this isn't just a vacuum. We're not just throwing this some IP names on some stuff. I've actually got a take here. Bruce Wayne is still in his bat cave or in his Wayne Manor growing up. This guy just became the real Joker. Yeah. Like he, he, he found, he saw Arthur was inspired, but found him wanting, took him out. Uh, and now this has got the guy that's got, that Bruce is going to have to deal with for the rest of his life. Well, and, and even if it doesn't have to be that, so whether Lee's alive or not mm-hmm. is irrelevant, it could still be that this, this guy saw her on the news. He'll have mm-hmm. a proto version of her in his head anyway. Yeah. Someone else can re- inhabit yep. that role as well later. Yep. Now, we would lose one part of the canon in some parts of the canon, at least, because um, some versions Harvey's friends with Bruce and mm-hmm. not. Yeah. The age difference here wouldn't work. Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's not like, you know, a one to one, but even the comics aren't, aren't you yeah. know. Like uh, BTAS leaned heavily on Harvey and Bruce being yeah, friends. But right. Previously, it wasn't that big of a deal. Like it's been right. around. Yeah. It depends on what, what you're looking at. I mean, sometimes I they're contemporaries. Yeah. Sometimes they're not. But this is, I mean, Paul Dini is one of the first people that just said, they were besties and we're going to make a thing of it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I love that, though, because not only do you, I, I don't want to get off into a rant about why I love BTAS, but mm. Jesus Christ, I love the idea of, you know, this, you know, clean cut dude who has a dark past, but he's Bruce's best friend and Bruce fails him in some capacity and he becomes mm. this villain. I love it. I love that shit. It is a good twist. I mean, I, I like that interpretation just fine. I love the guilt that Bruce has over the, Two-Face. The one thing, though, that like if we took all of these as protos and people are going to you know, pull up the baton, Harvey's going to be a hard one to do unless. Yeah. I mean, unless they do exactly the same as the Joker guy just did. Yeah. Because, I mean, he really is just mimicking right. what he saw on his version's face. Right. Mm hmm. I guess if somebody really wanted to be a, you know, I'm going to be the real two face, then you could go acid stain your own face. You could, but you know, it, you look at Gotham and Harvey was a young prosecutor there. Like while Bruce is a little kid I mean, yeah. and they kind of hinted at Harvey's uh, temper 
in uh, in Gotham. He would kind of snap a little bit. He would, and changed his voice and everything. And then um, I don't know. I guess he fucked off to Blue Haven in that show. He he was never seen again. <laughs> uh, I <laughs> really liked that actor. That actor, the shit out of shit. that actor was so good. He was. It was a shame that one. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen more from from him. He was great in Masters of Sex too. He was there, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, he was. And he was fantastic. Um, I love the cartoon intro. I forgot about that. The me and my shadow thing. The, well, I mean, the shadow is clearly the dark, the Joker persona, yeah. you know, like <clears throat> trying to get away from him, you know, lock him away and take control. I mean, I wondered when I, f- so when it first opens before we've gotten the rest of this movie to deal with, just in that intro where he locks, you know, the real version in the mm-hmm. uh, cupboard. Um, it, you were already thinking at that moment, okay, well, is this, ha- is this how he's dealing with what he did? I mean, that the cartoon sets you up very well for what we're about to do. Yeah. And yeah, sure enough, the shadow gets out, kills a bunch of people, but then turns out they have to be together after all. I guess that's mm-hmm. the only thing that we don't see in the cartoon is him kill the shadow almost. Well, I mean... Mm, I mean, he just became one with a shadow. I mean, like the cartoon did tell us what was going to happen. Like we were going to pretend that there were two separate entities, but Arthur at the end goes, mm, no, we're the same. I just fucked up. <laughs> I just realized the cartoon ends with an explosion. Doesn't it? I think so. I think so. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> See, this is think about that. <laughs> and I did, like I saw people complaining like Joker two starts with a fucking cartoon. I mean, oh, I just don't want to see this. I'm, I will not see it. And I'm like, Y'all are just so over dramatic little crybabies. Joker one was nothing but high concept all tour filmmaking bullshit. Why did you walk into this one that was called a musical, starts with a cartoon, and think you were getting anything close to a normal movie? Like yeah. this was not gonna be that's the that was my main takeaway. The thing I told you leaving the theater was I got exactly what I paid for. I expect I, I saw all of Todd Phillips press press yeah. leading up to the movie. He said it was going to be a certain thing. I walked out and I thought that was exactly the thing that was prescribed. Right. I, I, I believe you said what, what I was told I was going to get and what I got in the Venn diagram is a complete circle. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it very much is like, I don't know. I mean, our, our real life example of dude just walking out. I don't know what he was there for. I mean, it, a lot of uh, people's knee jerk reactions right now, I feel like are just their expectations kind of turning into resentment kind of thing. Like they're, they walked in expecting a movie that they weren't told to expect mm-hmm. to some extent. And on its own merits, there's plenty to like or not like about the movie. I mean, if you weren't up for this kind of faux musical thing, yeah, then I could see three, four, four movie or, you know, numbers in just kind of going, this ain't for me. Mm-hmm. Or if it's a little too dark in certain ways, I mean, you probably should have seen that coming from the first one, but yeah. Okay. Or hell, if it's not even killing people fast enough early on in the movie, you can almost see that. Mm-hmm. But because I mean, in front first half and second half, as far as actual, you know, action, action goes, a couple of cop beatings aside in the first half, there's yeah. kind of very little going on other than what, like one fantasy action little scene thing. Yeah. Um, this is a character study, man. Very much so. Character it's a, study. It's a, it's a film. It's, it's, a, exam- it's a film, not a movie. Examining expectations versus reality. Examining the you know fandoms. Yeah. Uh, followers, cult followings. Like that was a nice point. Um, speaking of fandoms, he is rescued by these people mm-hmm. and climbs out of the car hastily to escape them. To escape them because they're crazy. Because they're awful. I mean. It, we're we're interpreting a little bit of that, but yeah, like, uh-huh. he, he gets out because they're basically up there talking about, yeah, man, we're gonna we're, we're gonna turn this whole thing on its head. Oh, we blew up the, the fucking courthouse. We're gonna yeah. burn the city to the ground. And he's yeah. like, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at I this don't want point, to be a part of that. Yeah, and his and his character, he's just, I just want to get out of this thing and go see if I can find Lee. That's all I want. Like, yeah, he's just to try to find her. Yeah, he bounces on that one easily and quickly. Um, the music itself, you already hinted at it. That they did a really good job of. Uh, I almost spent some of the first part of the movie trying to figure out what the rules are because mm-hmm. there had to have been some, right? Maybe I mean, you can't make a. Even uh, I figured it could be different for a lot of people, but I figure if you're going to make a movie like this that plays with a couple genres like that, you kind of have to have some internal guidelines. Like, okay, well, when the music does this, we're going into right. X amount of reality, and when the music 
doesn't do that, then we're still probably in reality. In life. The one thing that I really noticed, because sometimes in real, in the real scenes where they're singing to each other, um, there will still be music, the music cues. The score almost. Yeah. Yeah. That goes along with the song. The, what I've noticed, though, is the stuff that happened in real life was very differentiated. Like, you start seeing them sing together or he's singing on TV on the, in the interview. It's acapella, baby. There is acapella, but there's, they still do put music, but then like they show people's reactions and those reactions are real world reactions. Like the fuck is he singing about? Yeah. You know, like, okay, well this is just bizarre. Right. Or even, and that's a funny reaction is one of the things that made it because you do, you spend some of this movie deciding what to d- interpret as real or not. Uh-huh. And one of the reasons in that interview that I decided that, oh, okay, this is part of reality is the cop's reaction yes. of all things, because he was the guard. so proud to hear the song, you know, he's doing yeah. a good job with it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then like, I think there's a very real differentiation when it's stuff in his head, like, yeah. or their head where they're just orchestration like, comes in the orchestration. They're in a completely different setting. It's like sunny and chair. It's, you know, a wedding venue thing of, you know, th- there's production behind it. It's, uh, it's very, very different. And, and alone, he puts on the makeup in his fantasies. Um, right. For most of it, at least. And that's, that's another reason, like, I don't think it's a musical because like, it doesn't have the rules of the musical, the uh, musicals rules generally are whether or not they're original songs for that production or covers, people break into fucking song. Everyone gets in on it. They dance. There's a whole thing. Reality for that film is that people break into song and do shit. That's a conceit. You just got to deal with it when you walked into the theater. That is not here in this yeah. movie. That is not part of this movie. Yeah. It's very different. I mean, you know, when you've walked into a, you know, Hammerstein piece or something that like, you, you know, when they start. Mm-hmm. You just know when they start the song, like it's going to be, you know, the, the literal lights are going to turn off on the side of the stage. And yeah. Like it's a whole production, literally. So, um, and this, he starts singing it. and people look at him like he's fucking crazy. Yeah. And I think on like, there's at least one mislead where he, you look at him crazy, but then we're all going to lean into it. He's going to keep singing. And that is what's yeah. actually happening. Yeah. And then there's other ones where we're going to find out in a second that he's doing that in his head. And it, you do have to just keep watching to figure out which one you're doing. Yeah. I do completely love, though, how throaty and real and broken a lot of their mm-hmm. singing is early, or uh, especially in the most real, you know. Yeah. It's heart rending. Yeah. It's, it's good. Yeah. I mean, Joaquin has an okay voice, but he's he's going to have a range, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, did a great job of keeping him in range when they want him to sound a certain way and really letting him push where it like hurts his voice. Yeah. Where, you know. He could probably vocal train out of that, but that, that's not what you want for this. A lot of the interviews I've been seeing kind of indicate that, uh, I mean, they flat out said that, like, Gaga, they had to, like, work with her to, like, not sound good. Not sound as good? Yeah. Like, can you just, like, fucking be broken? Can, can you just, like, How many cigarettes can you smoke before this take? <laughs> can you not sound amazing yeah. for half a second, please? Um, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. You'll, 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 you'll be seen. But just- like, at the end when he's kind of grabbing her face and mm-hmm. trying to get her not to sing. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, well, two things. One, in reality, when he's that close to her and she sounds that good, that is that that's actually her singing. Like mm-hmm. that, that's her not that you know not having to fuck up her voice, basically. But something that I think goes to my theory about that yeah, she's not she real. sounded really great she there. She sounded really good, and she he keeps messing with her mouth, and you don't hear any kind of like right. She and he's begging her to stop. Yeah, because that means she's imaginary. Yeah, fuck. That's so good. That's so good. That's a nice fun. That's a fun bit. Hey, Dave here. Before we jump back into our review of Joker Folly Ado, I'd like to tell you that we also recorded a really fun conversation for Patreon. You know, just a light rambling about why ghosts aren't ever described as floating or translucent before the 1900s. Aliens. Controversial AI opinions. Hopeful outcomes for our eventual fall to the AI empire. Among many other things. We had fun talking. We hope you have fun listening. It's just uh, one of the extras you get when you're a $5 patron. Patreon.com slash DC on screen. Yes, there is a link in the show notes. And that episode will be up sometime this week. It might even be up right now if you've waited to listen to our review. So, I don't know. Go check it out. Also, if you want, you can join our Patreon for free. You can join it for a dollar. That way you'll get every episode ad free. There are options. That's all I'm saying. Back to the show. I'm sorry, man. I don't know what your your problems are. I don't know if it's... (laughs) 
I don't know if it's like fan entitlement. I'm not mad at you either way. If you hated this movie, I don't know if it's like weird alpha male. I can't watch a musical or I'm gay. I don't know what the fuck your problem is, is, but this is a great movie. It was. Uh, (laughs) I'm going to insist that like, if we're going to make a difference between the the words, this is a film, not a movie. If you want to actually sit down and watch something like, It'll take me a long time to want to watch this again. Mm-hmm. I don't need to. I've I've got, I mean, I, I can. It's not like I've got every frame memorized. There's plenty I could go back right. and watch and listen and, and love more. But I won't need to, I won't have the like emotional capacity to sit down and do that again for a second. Yeah. I'll, I'll need to, I'll need to let that breathe. Yeah. This will be like a thing where like, I'm going to get this Blu-ray and I'm going to like put on Joker and then Joker too. Yeah. Back to back one day in like two years. Yeah. And just make a day of it and just sit there and like just really get absorbed. Just get absorbed as shit. Like Bethany will be out of town. I'm always just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna order in food or something and I'll just sit there and just watch it and just pizza and sparkling water. And we're gonna, yeah, yeah, just like like die on ashes mm -hmm. over these, over these depressing, wonderful movies. Um, but yeah, plot wise, nothing, nothing left behind. Um, I don't think so. Performance wise, uh, all of these people should be, they should be pelted with awards. Yeah. Um, and any number of technical aspects of this that should be pelted with awards. It just genuinely well made quality film. At this point, I shouldn't have to say it, but I know Rotten Tomatoes is sitting at about 45. Fuck them. Fuck Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, that that's a standard, a maxim for us even. This is a fantastic film. I don't care. Genuinely is. It's a, I th- I, like I said, I think it really is expectations. I think if you went in expecting to see the movie that you were told to go watch, you can have varying levels of how much you did or didn't like it, but it's not going to be 45% good. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be 70 or something. Like, it may not be the best one you've ever seen, but and, unless you were just betrayed by your own expectations of not seeing a musical or seeing too much of one yep. or not seeing Batman, even though we told you it's not going to happen, mm-hmm. like, then I think you'll be fine. And this is like a perfect example of like, how an era can't, it can be like not all bad. Like, cause this is, I think this is the final one. This is the final movie, the final pre gun development movie. Mm. Gotcha. I yeah. think it was even in production before gun took over. Uh, this is the final one of the Hamada era. And I think I'm going to maybe start defining that in my head as pre or post the formation of DC studios. Yeah. This is the final, like, Pre DC Studios, Warner Brothers. Before we decided we had to have a thing for it, right? And when we were just trying our best to make, you know, DC EU, Aquaman, whatever you think about that. I for me, that era went out on a fucking banger, dude. This yeah, was in great. that sense, yeah. That was if that was the the way we went out, then yeah, it it yielded some interesting crops, which is fun because in one sense, I you know I've always thought the the funniest thing was watching you know the Aquaman. End and just what I guess this this whole universe ends or universe of characters mm-hmm. or portrayals whatever you want to do with it is I guess going to peter out with um, Orm eating a cockroach burger, <laughs> but the era ends with but the production era I suppose ends with uh, Arthur Fleck yeah dying <laughs> on a floor bleeding out little little bits of little choices that were good include. Um, did you catch the blood in his mouth when he's singing mm-hmm. at the end in the fantasy? Oh, yeah. I, well, she had shot him in the fantasy, too. She had shot him in the fantasy, too. And, yeah, yeah that was going to play in. He goes back to that same spot, that same moment. But um, they cut from it. You, you never see past that moment in the original fantasy. He just yeah. wakes up. Um, but he, yeah, he uh, at the very end there, like, you, there's real blood in his fantasy mouth mm-hmm. um, as he's as he's dying. It. God, a hell of a portrayal, man. He looks so frail the entire time. Mm-hmm. I, look, I said two years. I'll be honest. I might watch this again with Bethany when it comes out on Max, when it hits Max or wherever it hits. Yeah. Because I kind of want to watch it again. I don't want to pay money to go see it. <laughs> I got to have limits. but Well, I mean, it's a it's very specific type of film. Yeah. Like, it's uh, it's a film, as you said. Like, it's, you know, there's a it, lot to think of. It requires uh, space, I think. Um and also, uh, I'll be honest, like, I don't, I, I felt just as, I honestly felt just as nervous seeing this one as I did the first one, but for slightly different reasons. Because, you know, there was so much to be said about, like, there were a lot of people were like, oh my God, people are going to freak out with this movie. And like, people are going to be, get violent watching this movie. They're going to be inspired by it. Uh, a lot of people were afraid of that. And I was a little, 
I'm already weird ever since that fucker came in and shot up Dark Knight Rises in yeah, the theater. The like, I'm already weird. So, like, while we're watching this one, guy, like, I was very aware of my surroundings in this one. That's why, like, I noticed the guy got up in a huff and stormed out and s- pushed pushed the door pushed the door so hard I heard it all the way up there and went, oh my god! Like, it scared me. I was yeah. like, I was like, oh god, is this it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, not like this, not like this, please. I mean, I'd kind of forgotten, I'd forgotten about the entire storyline in in the news of just. Oh, but what if the incels see it? Yeah. It was like what happened in the first Joker run of press. Yeah. And and we found out that like what the incels did with this one when Todd Phillips came out and said, by the way, all of you are crazy. He's not really this character. This is a facade and blah, blah, blah. Like he's very troubled. Yeah. The incels got mad and review bombed it. Yeah. And that's about it. But yeah. – <sighs> When you're review bombing because they didn't make a character evil enough to to match your sense of relating to that character, right. I think you need to go back to the drawing board a little bit on how you're approaching your life. But they nerfed them. They nerfed them. Uh. It's it's that that could be a problem. That that may require talking to someone. Yeah, and that poor fucker, by the way, who stormed out didn't even get to cool see the cool joke, actual Joker well, ending. I know uh, that's that part, the sad part. <laughs> that part cracks me up too, like because uh, he was he left probably about I don't know. If I had to bet, he, he left about 50 minutes, an hour in, something like that. Uh, yeah, I thought it was like 30, 35 minutes, something like that. It was somewhere like right before midpoint in my head. Yeah. And then just kind of symmetrically adjacent to that, just a little past it, you've got where I realized that he ha- was not coming back. Uh-huh. And then everything after that, I remember thinking, especially when the movie starts to veer into really like some plot points hitting you, you know, fast and fast and quick here. Mm-hmm. I kept thinking, I mean, man, we just too bored to hang out and that. Uh, Okay, because because stuff's really happening now. I mean, yeah. like you were my my the saving grace and what made me sit there and feel relatively comfortable was the fact that the guy got up and stormed out, and we were at a matinee show, and I'm like, you're not gonna come back in and like shoot up a theater full of like two two and a half people, three people, whatever. That's not really gonna get your name so much in the headlines. Like you're gonna want to hit like a late night show. You're, uh, well, yeah. That's a different kind of safety in numbers entirely that you're if, talking about here. Yeah. Like, like if you came and you're like safety and scarcity, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to kill some people. If this movie doesn't portray my hero the way I wanted to. Anyone who's not an American listening to us right now is completely baffled. Uh, no, by this I th- entire thought process. No, I think uh, <laughs> I th- like they know it from the outside. You're right. But yeah, they know it from the outside. I'm, I'm, I'm sure most people know, like in America, we have some shit to do. We have some stuff to worry about. <laughs> Yeah, like I'm like marking exits and shit and yeah. thinking about like, okay, well, if I hear that door slam open again, I'm ducking in a way that like hopefully he'll realize I'm not here anymore. Maybe I got mad and huffed out too. <sighs> what's oh going to be, what's going to suck about this Terrifying. is there's like, we have kind of vilified this guy as some version of a uh, shitty toxic fan, incel, possibly a celebrity wannabe shooter right. kind of thing. And we're just going to find out in reality that he got a text about his daughter going to the hospital or something. Right. Right. <laughs> and That's, had to rush out. Hey, and he's been mad about it all day because he really was enjoying the movie. Yeah. Hey man, if you are listening to the show and, uh, you know, you were Saw at the two weirdos behind you. If you were at the Regal 16, and then Truffle, somehow made it an hour into the review of that where we the, shit on you at the noon showing. And it was something else, like your mom died or something. Just yeah. let us know all the condolences. We'll, we'll do a personal uh, – uh, you'll have an apology on Spotify, so help me. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You'll have an absolute – yeah, we'll absolutely apologize to you. Um, you can stream it anywhere you like with the rest of our show. But, you know, there's a certain expectation when you see something like that. Uh, after you've been getting notifications after notification all day, everywhere you look, people being like – Angry that Joker 2 didn't have him be this, like, godlike anarchist. Yeah. They nerfed him. Yeah. By the way, that's a word I've been really annoyed with lately. Like, it's been going around. Like, I first noticed it, people complaining about uh, how they changed Hulk's character in the MCU. They're like, oh, they nerfed him. They nerfed him. They they made him a pussy. Uh, they nerfed him. And now I'm hearing about Joker. I'm like, Jesus Christ, y'all. That is a term I don't think I've heard since the last time. I mean, I honestly, that may be the incels coming back in a way. Like, I, I just, it's, like, it's the, like a term I only hear in certain, I don't know, areas. It's the Jordan Peterson alpha male kind of yeah, yeah. nozzles. A little bit. The, um, the, the exact bad guys in She Hulk. 
actually. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the actual like process of nerfing is about the most natural thing that could happen in any kind of writing like this. Mm-hmm. You overpower a character getting all excited as a writer and you eventually have to pull it back a little bit. Like we have been doing this literally since the yellow sun and kryptonite. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I've never been able to forgive DC since the old radio show, Adventures of Superman, where they introduced kryptonite. Yeah. You know what, though? At that point- <laughs> They nerfed him. Then they, then they made it to where magic fucks with them, too. Yeah. There's, <laughs> like, here's the thing. If I run into that guy who's actually still mad about those things, yeah. that OG has my respect. Well, he has my like, respect, because, first of all, because I want to know his, uh, you know, regimen. Health routine. Like, yeah. I want to yeah. know, like- How he's- Alive to complain about that in 115. Yeah. yeah. Right. Really? Like, so you were there. Yeah. <laughs> you were there to be upset that yeah. Superman got woke and nerfed. Yeah. I watched Seeker and Schuster lose their jobs. Yeah. Like, we the whole thing. No. Yeah. Well, well, he gave Lois her props on one episode. And that fucking pissed me off. <sighs> yeah. If I actually run into that guy, he's, he, he gets to say that. That one dude gets to, yeah. gets to complain about they actually like nerfed Superman. You, okay. You get to. Yeah. Everybody else can fuck off a little bit. Yeah. The one time Lois actually like turned around and, and didn't need saving back in the forties, he got mad and said, Oh, it's the DCU. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I haven't watched anything since. I'll never read a funny book again. It's they hard. really are un- unrealistic. It stopped his heart then. It's never beaten again, therefore he's still alive. He's yeah. undead, really. Yeah. At this point I want that guy to die. Never mind. He's lost my respect. You you've kind of taken that from me now. Yeah. You just fleshed it out too much. Yeah. For some reason, the bit in the movie where like Arthur stops signing the book and <laughs> writes, "I hope you get cancer," mm-hmm. shows up in my mind. Like, Jesus God, that was. I did. I forgot what the guard said that tipped him off. Didn't it'll I? be. It'll be. Uh, it'll be worth a shit ton once he once they fry his ass, something like that. Uh, okay. The, he. I knew he was getting the signature, and I knew Arthur knew he was getting the signature. I just. Yeah. I missed the audio yawned or something i don't know anyway okay. I, I didn't catch what he said about what was so egregious about that yeah after they fries that makes sense oh my god Can't, and I, I haven't brought it up yet i don't know i'm sure we reported it on this show i forgot that brendan gleason was in it that's his name the guard yeah jackie yeah oh i saw him and was like please don't just be a cameo please don't just be a cameo <laughs> please be a real thing please be a real please thing. be and I was so happy. Like that dude in Bruges, that dude in uh in the Banshees of Inishiran, mm-hmm. like so many movies, like he's so good. He's so good. I think you leaned over and you said something about like, I love him, everything I've seen him in, I want to slit his throat. Yeah. <laughs> he's so good. But I swear every time I see his face by the end of whatever that product is, I want him dead. It's not everything. It it's, it's all I could remember at the time. Everything. But actually both of the things I mentioned, I really like this character. <laughs> Like Banshees of Inishir and like he's best friends with Colin Farrell. Yeah. And like Colin Farrell comes up to talk to him and he's just like, he's just like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And he tells him like, we're not friends no more. Mm-hmm. He's like, but why? <laughs> why are we friends anymore? And he's like, I just don't fucking like you anymore. Yeah. Just leave me the fuck alone, you know? And then like he keeps like bugging him, harassing him, wanting to like, hey, please be my friend. I don't, what did I do? I just don't like you no more. If you talk to me one more time, I'm going to cut off a fucking finger. Yeah. And then he keeps doing it. And so he just, every time he talks to him, he cuts off and he's a fiddler. Mm-hmm. So he's like ruining his own livelihood, but he's like cutting off his fucking fingers and like, he like just walks across the entire island and goes to his buddy's house and just like they out. hear a thunk and they open the door and it's just a finger laying there. It's so good. It's such a good movie. It's such a good movie. I that was one of the that was and a movie where I kind of turned it on and then it was over and I didn't realize what had happened. Or I didn't I didn't realize I'd done that. Mm-hmm. I kind of accidentally watched that movie. I mean, it was a dark comedy. I enjoyed it. I didn't exactly know what to do with it as a genre when I was done. Um, it is a dark comedy that is really about the futility of conflict and the futility of war because the, the of, backdrop yeah. on the a neighboring island is quite literally a war, a war going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, it was a good movie and I enjoyed it. I just turned it on to see what was going on with it. Like everybody's talking about this. Let me just watch a few minutes, two hours later. Yeah. I finished it. I was, yeah, it was great. It, it was good. And dude, Barry Keegan killed it. Oh, destroyed. Destroyed. Oh, I just wanted to I just wanted to hold his lifeless just, around body and cry. Yeah. I have occasionally just 
inserted well, there goes that dream then in my conversations and uh a couple of people have actually known what the fuck i was talking about because uh-huh. that one was so popular but there goes that dream then yeah. oh jesus that was heartbreaking but hilarious somehow it was time. i didn't laugh a single i didn't i didn't so much as sort through my nose laugh while watching that movie but i yet understood that it was funny yeah it's one of those it's of- funny but you want to cry when he says it like, yeah it's so sad because the dude's like abused by his dad he's the town idiot like oh god but yeah, sorry. Banshees of Inisherin. If you haven't seen so it, good. check that shit out. That's so so good. And but his acting seen- here was no was no uh, no worse. No. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I I can't I can't uh, say enough about uh, Gleason's acting. I loved it, and I uh, was ha- happy as hell to see him here. Not a sour note in the entire thing on the acting. I even got to see. Um, I don't have one period. I, I mean, loved the I movie. Don't. Um, the like the only thing I didn't like about the movie in any capacity really was just the the setting of it being those particular like I, I hate that era of clothing. Oh, so I know it's a period piece, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean I like it any better <laughs> when mm-hmm. I see it. Um, like that, and like I guess if you wanted to shave the two hour eighteen, you probably could have cut some of the length of the songs down a little bit. But like I don't need it. Yeah, they, I, they I mean they were intrusive. fine as they were. Like it. I, I would probably actually enjoy them more the second time because the only thing about it I, I experienced watching that I think would be different second time is mm-hmm. that I would probably get more time to play with the songs uh, or to let them breathe. Cause as the songs are happening, I find myself like watching it. Now I was going between the, what is reality game mm-hmm. a little bit. I'm also doing the little kind of trying to figure out what the rules are about what I'm, well, that goes into the what's reality game, but there's yeah. a little bit of rules about how the characters are playing in there that was different, but I think I would actually just stop and enjoy the songs a little bit more this time. Yeah. I think second time. I was thinking about the fact that there were songs more than I would have otherwise thought about it. Second time I see it, I'll probably like pay attention to the lyrics more and probably like, very much. and equate them more with what is going on with the characters and what they're trying to say in the movie. I'm not a lyrics gone first listen to yeah. anything in general. Like if I could memorize an entire album without knowing 50% of the lyrics, if if you hand me a new, like a new fresh album from somebody mm-hmm. that I'll, I'll know it note for note as far as the music goes. And I'll know what the sounds are of the voice, of course, but I won't look up the lyrics until like several listens in. Yeah. It, it'll be, that's a different experience for me, it, which I enjoy because I, then I get to go play with the lyrics too. It's like yeah. opening another hidden chest. Yeah. Um, for me, like the music is just like kind of, the music is always going to be kind of chaos to me because I don't quite understand music on a technical level, but I understand writing. Yeah. So when I so I usually listen to lyrics first, but like the first watch of like a movie, I'm trying to grab Im- pay attention to imagery as well. Yeah. So I'm kind of hearing phrases. Like my brain will glom onto phrases, and I'd be like, "Oh, that's tasty. I like that." Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just try to get an overall idea with the imagery, what what they're going for. Yeah. And then later, I'll like really listen to the lyrics, and probably the third or fourth time I watch it, I'll really pay attention and. I get into a lot of other things, but the first time I hear a song in general, and this it applies very much to something like this, is I hear very much the tone and connotation of it emotionally before I hear, before I actually hear the the actual thing they're saying with their mouths. Mm-hmm. I'll hear what how they're saying it. Yeah, when I'm listening to a song. So this this version fit for me because I think if I didn't have a single lyric or you just warbled rounds so you couldn't hear anything, I would have gotten the same thing out of those scenes at least. Mm-hmm. Like, I would have been fine with that. And that, again, I think that was just also part of the direction and everyone who was involved in all of the music design for this thing being really fucking good today. Yeah. You know what? Like, I was actually worried uh, when we got that report that they would just, like, throw out the script and run away and talk and write shit on a napkin. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is going to be a bloody mess. Yeah. You were very worried about that piece of news. Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, th- I thought it was a masterpiece. I thought it was fantastic and if everyone shits on it if it doesn't make money he wasn't planning on making another one anyway and i kind of think he was hoping it didn't do well because i don't think he wants to make another one if it was a billion dollars they would want a third oh yeah for sure well to that end that's a good you know made a take on you know what's todd phillips's relation to the joker in this movie is well y'all saw the joker you kind of made too much of it in a certain way well yes. let me bury the concept for you here i think that's what he did i uh, think that's absolutely wrote himself out like yeah <laughs> i think he went the people who are going to who were who this is for are going to love this and the people who aren't are going to fucking get what they deserved like yep, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i think i'm good you, you want to end it yeah we should call it
Go watch this movie. We'll probably end up residually talking about it for a few weeks just yeah. because I don't know, I'm going to enjoy the memories of it for a minute. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll probably be back in a few days with some news. And until then, keep some DC on your screen. Bye.